Hello. Hey, everybody. Hi, Mike Elson, founder of VoiceLessons.com. With me, I have Dr. Matt Edwards. Matt, thanks for joining me again today. Happy to be here. Awesome. Well, hey, we're going to jump into some uh, live Q&A questions. And uh, hey, everybody, make sure you're taking your vitamins, getting plenty of rest, drinking plenty of water. There's a lot of uh, extra as uh, flus floating around right now. So um, okay, cool. Uh, here we go. First question we got for today. Is there any way to carry chest voice up high without damaging my vocal cords? This one comes in from Eliana. All right. So you had some experience, didn't you, at one point in time with somebody trying to shove your chest voice up too high? <laughs> yeah, you know, there we go. I can see. If you, you definitely can uh, damage your vocal cords uh, if you go too high. Um, and not only the vocal cords, but you can, you know, you can dislocate arytenoids. You can do a lot of extra things. So you really yeah. got to be careful. Yeah. So we can, this can actually happen is essentially yeah. right, my point. And so um, you can, but it's actually called mix, right? So we have uh, various vocal qualities. And the way I like to describe them is to use your hands, okay? So let's assume that if I have my hands together, the thumbs are just the arytenoids. They're these little things that stick up in the back that help open up the vocal folds. So we're not gonna really count them, okay? But the vocal folds themselves, we're gonna imagine that the four fingers are the thickness of the vocal fold. Now, mind you, if you're actually in a cadaver lab and you see one, and we're talking like a millimeter or two thick, right? They're teeny tiny little things. So this is a far exaggeration of their size. But our current understanding, and I say current understanding because the scientific literature on the singing voice is expanding rapidly right now. We're getting all kinds of new uh, equipment that's helping us gain new insight to how the vocal folds function. So we're learning a lot. But our current understanding is, is that registers are created by variations in what we call the closed quotient. The amount of time per cycle that the vocal folds are closed versus open. And we measure this with chymography. We have um, another uh, a piece of equipment called an EGG where we put electrodes on the side of the larynx. You don't feel anything, but it can tell when the vocal folds are together or not. And then it shows us a nice little curve that shows us when they touch and when they're open. Our current understanding is if they're firmly closed together, let's say 70% of the time, it's kind of like this four finger vocal fold closure, that we're going to get more of that chest dominant quality. Now, if we're up in our falsetto, then let's say maybe we're touching like 20% of the time. When it's a really breathy, ah, really breathy closed phonation. So those are our two extremes, chest and head. Everything in the middle is what we currently call mix. And what mix means is that we're bringing and combining elements of those two extremes together to find all the qualities in the middle. And there are endless possibilities of mix, right? We have some mixes that are more of a three finger mix, which we would call chest mix. And that can safely be done when we go up to belt. We have more of a head dominant quality that we call head mix. And that is definitely safe. And that's where a lot of opera singers are singing. Uh, uh, identi female identifying opera singers, counter tenors, sing up in the upper part of their voice. They're more on that two finger rather than the three or four. We don't want to carry four all the way up because that's what makes it sound like you're yelling. So if I carry four all the way up, we get, yeah, 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 yeah. And you hear the person scream, things strain in the throat, uh, facial muscles strain as well. Instead, we want to mix in some of that falsetto quality. Yeah, 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 yeah. And use that lightning to find a chest dominant mix. So instead of, yeah, 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 where we yell, we're going to, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're lightening up into that mix. Now, as you're listening to my voice, you need to understand that A, I'm not an active singer, and B, I'm a low male voice, right? I'm more of a bass baritone. So when I go up there, it has one quality. But if you're a, a tenor or a higher voice uh, male identifying singer, you're going to get a different quality, the quality you want, right? And if you are a female identifying singer with estrogen dominant vocal folds and you go up and you thin out a little bit, you're going to be able to belt. And when we get up there and we thin out, every person's thinning out is going to sound a little bit different. And you can hear this easily just by jumping on Spotify or on YouTube and look up Ariana Grande. Ariana Grande is on the lighter side of a vocal mix, right? She has this really great high range, but it's not the same power as Christina Aguilera, 
who's on the chestier side, thicker vocal folds. Now, part of that you're born with, right? We all have different anatomy that we're born with, and some people's vocal folds are a little thicker. Uh, some vocal tracts, are, or every vocal tract is a different shape, but some are much bigger than others. And it's the combination of the way that the vocal folds are made up and the shape of the vocal tract that gives each person their individual timbre, which means the color of their voice and the weight of their voice, whether they have a voice that's real heavy like mine or a voice that's a little bit lighter like Mike's, right? So if I am in my uh, chest dominant mix, I can still make a real operatic sound, but it's pretty heavy. Um, is definitely not me just shouting. That's got a mix to it. But if you had Mike when he was not sick doing the same thing, you would get a more tenor-like quality, even if he was in a similar closure rate. And that's because of the variations in the vocal folds. So yes, Ariana, um, there is definitely a way to carry chest voice up into the upper part of your range without causing damage, but it's called mix. And you may find some people call it chest dominant mix. Some people call it an overdrive or a curbing that they do as they get up into that upper part of their range. What you call it doesn't matter as much as the function. And what's important about the function is you're not slamming those vocal folds together and trying to carry the full mass uh, uh, vibrational pattern all the way up into the upper part of your range, but rather you're thinning out as you go up so you can navigate those notes easily. I'm so glad you said that because in the beginning when you're talking about the depth, right, I think I think it's important to talk about the actual vocal cords themselves and the registrations. There's the mass and the depth. And yep. you talked about thinning and lightening up, right? But there's there's also the stretch. So I think the important thing to, to not miss on the, the, the 3D model of your hands, if you will, is that as we go higher, they actually have to stretch and you have to have that cricothyroid pull antagonistically to the, to the arytenoid so that you do stretch to go higher. Otherwise, you're definitely going to be pulling chest voice, I think is the term people will call it, right? You're pulling chest too high um, because you're not letting it shift gears or you're not letting, you know, the, the registration take effect. You have to get rid of that mass. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And there's lots of layers to this, Eliana. Uh, you know, like Mike was saying, there's a stretching action, the thinning out action, there's a compression action. So there's lots of it. Uh, you know, there's uh, great resources to go more in depth to what all those things are. But for now, as you're starting down this path, uh, start looking up how to mix. Awesome. Great. Well, that's some good, good uh, thoughts there. Let's jump into the next question. How do you correct vocal cord damage? This one comes in from Cynthia. Good. So, Cynthia, the first thing to know is that vocal cord damage is normal. It happens. So the estimates that I've seen in recent research is around 33% of, sing uh, not singers, but just the general population has some kind of vocal pathology. And that's because we consider like acid reflux of vocal pathology. There's scarring that can happen from overuse or uh, uh, smoking or other environmental factors that can contribute. So if you do get an injury, it's not the end of the world. And at 90, I would say 95%, I think, of vocal injuries can be healed uh, well. And it's if, with early intervention. The problem is where people run into uh, bigger issues is if they just keep ignoring the problem and they keep singing on it. So like maybe they started off with a small little, what we call a lesion on the vocal fold, but because they keep singing on that small lesion, it starts affecting the other vocal fold and everything swells up to the point you got to get an operation done. Right. And anytime we go for an operation, then there's some risk that things aren't going to return to normal. So at the first sign of any kind of vocal change that lasts for more than two weeks. All right. So like, you know, Mike's got a bit of a cold. Uh, and so as he's talking, you can hear that his voice is kind of husky. It's not the way that he normally sounds. Now, two days ago when I talked to Mike yesterday, even I think when I talked to Mike, he could barely phonate. He could barely make sound. So he's improving. So we're not running to the doctor if we have a sudden voice change, you know, all of a sudden you've coughed some, you lose your voice, and then you start getting it back. That's pretty normal. But let's say Mike's voice doesn't come back two weeks down the road. Two weeks down the road, what I'd be saying is that you need to go see a laryngologist. Now, this is important. There are ear, nose, and throat doctors. But ear, nose, and throat doctors are generalists. And generalists can sometimes miss things, right? They're used to looking for big problems, and if they don't see a big problem, they can miss it. You might have a small problem. But even with a the generalist, they can miss big problems. Uh, my wife has an uncle who uh, was told he had a vocal cord infection by an ear, nose, and throat doctor. And I had said to the uncle, I said, that's not really a thing. I would get a second opinion. 
And this was a VA hospital, so he didn't go get another option until it didn't improve for about three, four months. And finally, he went and got a second opinion outside of the VA and found out he had laryngeal cancer. So that this VA doctor who was a certified ear, nose and throat doctor had missed laryngeal cancer because for some reason he apparently hadn't seen it enough to know what it was. So that's why if you're a professional voice user, you don't go to a generalist, you go to a specialist, right? A specialist is a board certified laryngologist. This is somebody who has done extensive training, learning about voice disorders, how to operate if an operation is necessary, but more importantly, how to work with a voice care team, specifically a speech language pathologist. Speech language pathologists study the rehabilitation of the voice after someone has a, uh, had an injury of some sort. And they know how to reestablish a better vibrational pattern of those vocal folds, which in many cases will help the damage resolve on its own because our bodies are pretty miraculous and they can heal. So with that speech language pathologist, they're going to run you through a lot of exercises that'll help you change the way that you bring those vocal folds together. You start vibration and then the way that you uh, possibly even pronounce your words. And as you work on that, you will start to find that the voice will clear up, things will get easier, and any injury that you may have uh, you know, had happen to you will start to resolve itself. So the, you know, the main thing is, is don't freak out if it's only been a couple days. If it's been two weeks, definitely time to go look into it. Know that if you get into the doctor's office and they say, um, I hate to tell you this, and there's bad news that follows, it's not the end of the world. There are plenty of other people that have been in your shoes before. Uh, go look up Adele. You can even watch if you get on and look up uh, National Geographic, incredible human machine, Steven Tyler on YouTube. You can find a video of Steven Tyler having an operation done on his vocal folds with a laser where they actually go in there and they resolve a little hemorrhage that he has with the laser beam, zap, it's done, finished, right? So if they do have to do things, there's so many easy ways to resolve these problems. Most important thing is just to get them addressed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, it's never it's never fun to, to to get sick and have a head cold and then cough a lot. Um, but, you know, these things, they they go away in a few days, we typically expect. And let's let's hope it's not here in two weeks. Right. But if it is, then that's what you go see a doctor for. Right. So um, awesome. Next question. OK, my jaw is so tight all the time when I sing. Why does that happen? This comes in from Kaylee. Good question, Kaylee. A lot of people struggle with this. So there's two points of view that we can look at with this. We can look at the point of view that registration is the issue, and then we can look at the point of view that it's actually some sort of a tension in your jaw uh, muscles themselves, which could be caused by neck issues or you know other things that are related to uh, the way that you're uh, you know trying to form your vowels and words. So let's look at the registration issue first. Since we already talked about uh, carrying chest up too high, well, one of the things that can happen is if you do carry that chest voice up too high, then you get the larynx rising along on the way. And as the larynx rises up, it shoves into the tongue, and a lot of times your body's going to try to compensate by moving your neck. And as soon as you do that, you've now put stress on the muscles that open the jaw, and the muscles that close the jaw are now going to fight back. And the next thing you know, you got jaw tension. So what I would say is let's be sure that your registration is balanced in the area that you're trying to sing. Make sure that it's not too chesty and that you have the right amount of airflow. Now, if you're running into jaw tension when your voice is breathy, that could also still be a registration issue. Because if the voice is too breathy and you're trying to bring clarity to the sound, you might end up constricting muscles in your vocal tract, in your jaw, and your tongue to try to make the sound clear. When the only solution to clarity is rebalancing the registration so there's a little bit more chest in the mix. So this can go both ways. Too much chest can cause problems. Too much head can cause problems as well. That's why ideally a singer has full control of their registration and they can make every variety of quality on any given sound. And if we watch the shows in the past, I've talked about registration, method of Oche exercises. That's where we take a <laughs> Then we practice starting light and breathy, going to full chest and back. We'll see where this is after six hours of teaching today. But, uh, uh, 
getting that kind of control on every single note in your range is going to enable you to be able to get up on one of those pitches where that jaw is too tight and either add a little bit more chest to see if the jaw lets go or add a little bit more head to see if the jaw lets go. Now let's say that that doesn't just work for you. Well, then we're gonna have to check a couple things. The first thing we're gonna to wanna to do is make sure that your head is actually balanced on your spine in what's called the AO joint. And it's this little guy right here. And this little space is actually located in between your ears. So if these are your ears, and you could draw a line right through, that would be the AO joint. And the AO joint rests right on the cervical vertebrae. And that cervical vertebrae should hold the weight of your head. Now, if you start leaning your head forward, let's say you're uh, you know, a guitar player, and you're trying to lean into your microphone as you sing, you have now just put a whole lot of extra weight onto those cervical vertebrae, and now all of your neck muscles are gonna have to try to compensate to hold your head upright. As they start to engage, you're going to have some in the front that are going to be trying to engage and pull things back. And guess what? Those muscles, when they're trying to engage and pull back, they all overlap the larynx. So here's some of those neck muscles here, and there's your larynx. Right? So if that neck is jutted forward, these muscles are going to try to compensate to pull you back into alignment, and they're going to impact your larynx, and then that can end up ricocheting up and causing this jaw tension. So we want to check posture and make sure that we are aligned and balanced. Then the next thing we're going to want to do is check in on the masseter muscle and the temporalis muscle. Mm -hmm. These are the two jaw closers. And so the easiest way to see if this muscle is trying to engage is to find your cheekbone right there and then glide your fingers down so you're right underneath the bone and then just kind of gently press in on that muscle as you open your mouth. Pressing in on this, which is called the origination point, will weaken the muscle's ability to close, and it will help you figure out if that muscle's kicking in. Because you'll feel it fighting you, and you may feel that it's real tender. So you put your fingers in there, drop your jaw, and sing. Ah, and if it's trying to kick, you'll feel it. It'll go, ah, and you go, oh, yeah. And then you're aware of this muscle, and you can start to let it go. You might want to check in with that temporalis muscle on the side of your head and massage it as well. I like to sometimes have students take their three fingers up here and then their thumbs into that into the master muscle itself. So we get the temporalis and the master muscle and massage those guys out. And as you sing and teach those muscles that they don't uh, have to engage in order for you to vocalize, you should start to see some freedom show up. Now, the other thing that can cause this muscle to kick in is if the muscles underneath of your larynx, right? So we have all these sub-mandibular uh, muscles right under here, underneath the tongue, right? Mm -hmm. They attach like this hyoid bone up here to your chin. There's even a muscle called the digastric that goes from here up to the hyoid bone all the way back up here behind your ear. And if those muscles are working really hard because you have tongue tension of some sort and they're trying to pull down, this muscle is gonna fight back and try to clench in. So if massaging this muscle isn't enough, you're going to want to look at actually tongue articulation drills and try to start practicing tongue twisters and getting your tongue to move freely because as you improve the agility of your tongue, more than likely you're going to see this let go. And it's highly probable that if you're struggling with registration and the tongue is kicking in at the same time, you're going to need to hit both the tongue and the registration to truly find freedom. Because if you've been carrying up too much chest voice, that tongue muscle is going to really try to fight back. And it can become so habitual that even though you're trying to get your registration balanced, it will not let go. So getting it to let go will then let the laryngeal muscle start to take over. And then you'll be able to balance that registration and this should go away. All right, so multiple ways to look at it. Just to recap, we can look at it as do you have too much chest, too much head. Either one of those can cause you to do uh, constrictions of the vocal tract that can affect uh, your jaw and give you jaw tension. We're going to check that masseter muscle to make sure it's not trying to contract. And we also want to check in on that temporalis muscle because those two work together to help close your jaw. And then if we feel those are uh, not in the way, we also want to check uh, actually the four of those posture to make sure that your head is balanced on that AO joint, that your neck isn't uh, jutted forward because that will cause you jaw tension problems. So that first, then check in that master muscle. And then if all else fails, double check on those muscles underneath and see if those are engaging as well. And if as you're going through all of those things, it's still not fixing it, this is where you want to consult a professional voice teacher 
You can visit us over on voicelessons.com. We have a whole teacher matching program. We can help you find a voice teacher who can help you work through these issues and find the custom-made, tailored solution for you and your specific needs. And most people, uh, once they get the uh, exercises that are right for them, will start to see results in about six to eight weeks. Absolutely. Great. Okay, so let's jump on to the next question that we've got. Kaylee, hopefully that, that helps give you plenty of things to think about and work on. Uh, the next one, is there a certain way to like say words? This one comes in from Danny. Yes. Danny, it depends. Okay. So if you are trying to sing opera or classical, then yes, there is a certain way. Classical singing is a very codified technique. We know that the words to caro mio ben are supposed to be caro mio ben, not caro mio ben. Right? So there's no wiggle room. But in a song that's a little bit more from a, a popular style, let's take Amazing Grace, right? a common uh, song that's sung as a hymn, or sung as a contemporary praise and worship song. You could sing classically, Amazing Grace. You can make it less formal, Amazing Grace. Or you could make it more country, Amazing Grace. Drawing on your accent. I'm from Southern Ohio, so I can just draw on my Southern Ohio accent. So in a song like that, there's not a certain way to pronounce the words. The only way that you should be pronouncing the words is in a way that communicates the message you are trying to give. If you are trying to uplift others by singing Amazing Grace, then you should be pronouncing your words in a way that uplifts. Amazing Grace, how sweet. Bright sounds. Bright vowels tend to have, be uh, perceived as higher energy emotional states of being like joy. So those brighter vowels and more chest dominant sound are going to usually lift people up. Low energy emotional states of being like tenderness are going to have more airflow and warmer vowels. So if I want to comfort somebody when singing Amazing Grace, I'm going to move towards closed vowels with a little more head in the registration. Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. So depending on what I'm trying to do with the line that I'm singing, my words need to follow my storyteller. Okay? Then, like I said, you're going to look at there are exceptions, but they're kind of rare. And they tend to mainly be over in the world of classical singing or the world of musical theater. Because in the world of musical theater, we do try to go to that like generic American speech that you hear on TV. Right, and so that's what most actors use in TVs and movies, unless they're set in the South or in a place where there's a specific accent. But you, you know, you hear what I'm talking about if you listen to TV enough. Listen to broad news broadcasters; they've got that pretty generalized American speech. So music theater kind of lives there. But you have a whole lot of leeway to play with, and the way that you pronounce words is part of what makes you the unique artist that you are. So in fact, as a voice teacher, I always have to be careful with, especially singer-songwriters, that I don't make any changes to the way that they pronounce their words that actually takes away their signature sound and harms their artistic work, right? So there's a whole lot of nuance to this. Um, the only other thing I throw in here is the other time that we would uh, make an adjustment to the way you say words is if you have a lot of tension. And so if you're doing amazing grace, that's caused by tongue retraction and narrowing. Mm -hmm. So in that instance, we probably would make an adjustment to make it easier for you to sing, right? So lots of shades of gray in this conversation, but in general, classical, yes. Musical theater, yes. Everything else, storytelling driven and let the emotion lead the way. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great um, a great recap. So, Danny, you got your homework cut out for you on that one. Let's move on to the next one. Um, this question comes in from Lydia. My voice can get stuck in the back of my head. What What do you think that means, and what, what can we give to Lydia to help her out with this? All right, so Lydia, what we are talking about essentially is resonance. And the other part of this that always comes into it is registration. Okay, so let's start with why we feel things in the first place. Our vocal tract is surrounded by bone, okay? So here's the vocal tract itself. 
in the back are the cervical vertebrae, boom. Vibrations travel really well across hard surfaces. So whenever you're making sound, vibrations are traveling up through this vocal tract, they excite some of the bone. We have some emerging research that says that the secret frequency is around 800 to 1000 hertz, which is the uh, frequency wave at which your bones start to vibrate. So around that frequency range, we might start to feel some vibration happening. The roof of your mouth is bone. You can see it on the skull. There you go. The inside of your mouth is bone. You can feel it by running your tongue across the roof of your mouth. So again, as frequencies travel through your vocal tract, they're going to excite that bone and those vibrations are going to travel around your skull and you are going to feel something. Now, where we feel those vibrations has a lot to do with the vowel quality that we're making. Brighter vowels have more high frequency energy. Warmer vowels, closed vowels, have more low frequency energy. If we are singing with warm vowels, we may not get the kind of frequencies that are gonna vibrate those cheekbones, the upper roof of your mouth, and your nose. And depending on the person, it is quite possible that you would then perceive your sound as going up and back on a closed vowel. If you brighten those vowels though, you're gonna be changing the shape of your vocal tract and amplifying some of those higher frequencies. And when you do that, you could likely get the, uh, the sensations of vibrations to shift. So an easy way to do this is just to hum. And as you're humming, I want you to just move your lips around and your mouth around. So we're gonna go Now as you're moving your vocal tract, you should feel that those vibratory sensations shift along the way. That's because you're essentially changing the vowel quality. If we open up your mouth, you would either have a brighter O or an A ah or a darker O or an A ah based off of where your lips were in that cycle of changes that we were making, okay? Now, I mentioned at the top of this that registration can actually be part of the problem. Why is that? Well, those vocal folds are creating the frequencies that the vocal tract amplifies. So, if your vocal folds are only lightly touched together, and you're trying to send the sound through your vocal tract, you may not be able to even create the frequencies you need to feel any vibrations, and you might feel it coming up back. However, if you start getting those vocal folds more closed together, a little bit more chest register inside of it, a little more adduction, closure of the folds, you're gonna start creating higher frequency energy, and you may start to feel those vibratory sensations shift a little bit forward, okay? So that's where resonance and registration come into the picture. And the final part of this is actually your own unique anatomy. Everyone's vocal tract has unique uh, dimensions, okay? No two are the same. That's why we have different standards. There's been research done where they take impersonators, right? Like an Elvis impersonator, one of the best in the world. And you compare his vocal output to Elvis's, and it's still different. Statistically significant. You cannot just replicate perfect, perfectly every single nuance of another person's voice. We have some uh, emerging research that's telling us that not only the distance between the teeth and the roof of the mouth, but the depth from the bottom of those upper molars to the top of the uh, roof of your mouth influences resonance. So if you've got a flatter arch space and a narrow arch space, you might have more brightness to your voice. If you have a wider arch and a higher roof of your mouth, you might have more depth to your voice. If you have really large tonsils that are really close together and you only have a little hole in the back, you might not feel resonance the same way as someone who's had their tonsils removed and has a wide open space in the back, all right? There are measurements that anesthesiologists use to actually look at what the structural shape is in the back of your mouth if they are worried about you know uh, putting a breathing tube in your mouth. And on one end of the spectrum, everything is naturally wide open. And on the other end of the spectrum, everything is closed up and you can't even really see the hole in the back. So those anatomical variations that occur from person to person are going to also contribute to how you feel resonance in your own voice. And so that's why Mike and I, in our teaching, we don't really focus on trying to uh, place the voice anywhere or worrying about where the voice places itself until we get the sound we want. So that's why in functional voice training, if we focus on register, vowel, and intensity, and pitch is in there too, right? Because we're always choosing a pitch. I kind of take pitch for granted in that uh, situation. But uh, register, vowel, and intensity, 
you will start to find functional freedom in the vocal mechanism and then the vibrations will reveal themselves and then when you get maximum freedom you will be able to either make an ah vowel where you do feel that oh, an ah vowel where you don't feel that and it's all up front ah and then everything in between ah, right and how do i choose where to land in that spectrum the story right if i'm telling a story that's about lifting people up i'm probably going to be in a brighter place but if it's a story about tenderness or sorrow or a place of lower energy emotional state of being then i'm probably going to go into that warmer place because that's the place that makes more sense yeah absolutely i i think matt that's a great uh, response to that because initially when i read this question i was thinking i had something to do with maybe the the sensations from the resonance right she's feeling like it's stuck in the back um and then the next thing i think well if you've got um good registration um and we choose a bright vowel we can we can probably get her to feel the sensation more forward so you know without necessarily hearing the voice of lydia if, if you if you do watch us which we hope um this helps you send us in a video happy to take a look and help you out with that too so um but you don't want to have your voice feel stuck anytime we want it to be free we want it to be flexible we want it to be in the back in the front we want to be able to change it you know where where we feel it and also vary the pitch so i guess you know the next thing understanding where was it a certain pitch range if you go higher does it still feel stuck in the back you know does it feel like it's going more forward um and sometimes those sensations we're expecting them to change as the pitch changes as the the vowel um you know has to 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 modify for the registration so a lot of good stuff on that one hopefully you found that helpful um let's go to the next one we've got here i'd like to expand my falsetto this comes in from johnny right. johnny you, you know um can never have enough falsetto uh, because especially as a as a, um, as a male, uh, we we hardly rarely will speak in our falsetto voice because it's just not normal. You know, we're just not going to do that. So um, it's definitely some an area to work on, and sometimes can be neglected. Um, just like sometimes the there there are female singers that forget to work on their chest voice, right? So you just have to kind of go, okay, how do you expand the falsetto? So Matt, what do you got on this? How, how can we expand falsetto? Yeah. So this is a, a great question. I uh, run into many, many uh, biological men uh, or testosterone dominant voices that do not practice in their falsetto. And I cannot tell you how big of a mistake that is. Uh, your vocal folds have muscle that runs through the uh, middle of them and inside of the muscles a ligament. And as you age, you are going to discover whether you like it or not, that muscles and ligaments get stiff. Okay. And you're going to find it's harder to bend over. It's harder to stretch, lift up into the air, all kinds of things. Well, at the same time, your body is stiffening up. If you're not exercising those vocal folds, they're going to start stiffening too. So falsetto singing, head dominant singing is critical because it keeps a nice stretch on those muscle fibers so that they don't stiffen up on you. And it keeps stretching that ligament so it doesn't get tight. This is the best way to ensure that you keep your high notes that you have. And it's one of your best bets at improving the upper part of your range and getting better high notes is through falsetto work, okay? If you don't already have a falsetto, you're gonna have to discover it through playing. So you're gonna try to make like hooty owl sounds, try to imitate a, 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 an estrogen dominant voice, a soprano voice, a whoo, and you're just gonna find whatever it is that you can. I meet many people who can find about one singular pitch, and they'll go, that's all I got, fine. What you're gonna then do is you're gonna find that singular pitch, find it on the piano that's a c sharp then what you're going to do is just start sustaining it and holding it as long as you can ooh, i like ooh up there some people like ah, ooh, ooh. Eh, whatever you yeah. want right who's who's a good one it, it it definitely helps extra with the falsetto i think it does a lot and that's why i like to start there but you know when we're just trying to first start the sound i always say fine just find it find it sure right? But so then what you're going to do is you're going to then start working that falsetto and trying to rock it up a half step and back down. Now, if you don't already have a keyboard, you're probably going to want to get a keyboard app for this, or you can just try it uh, using pitches inside your head. On a keyboard app, like I said, you don't even have to know how to read pitches. You're just going to find a pitch. 
And then once you know that, it's either going to be a white key or a black key, and then you're going to go up the next white key. So if you're on a black key, you go up to a white key or a white key to a white key, right? So just whatever's the next note. And we're just going to try to rock it back and forth. And we'll do it down. Once you get that down, see if you can rock more than one pitch. Then you're going to go on to those one, two, ones. Then you're going to expand that. And start building exercises. We can also build exercises that descend. Once you're able to do that, that's called a five, four, three, two, one pattern. It's the sol, fa, mi, re, do. All right, up the sol, fish scales. We're gonna try to take that as low as we can. breathy sound going. What that's going to do is it's going to teach your vocal folds that they can let go throughout your range, that you can increase airflow, and that's going to give you a, a more head dominant mix as part of your uh, palette of colors that you can sing with your palette of vocal colors, and it's going to make it more uh, possible for you to have variety and nuance in everything that you sing. And then as you continue to practice into that falsetto -y voice, that head voice, then you can start to crescendo it and eventually get to a heady mix and then bring that more into a chest dominant mix. And that will give you even more colors to play with and more ability to nuance every one of your uh, phrases in your songs. Yes, ab absolutely. I think, I think that's great. Um, I would definitely start around uh, maybe G in between the middle C and the C4 or so, so uh, G4 ish right um a nice place for the male voice to go with the ooze um and like matt uh said you know you're probably going to start with a little bit more like a pure falsetto it's not going to sound too developed but there's going to be stages there's actually stages at which your your false falsetto voice can progress and develop additional scales until you can take that because you you know falsetto we talked about kind of the the mass of chest uh, chest voice, right? But falsetto are on the edges, right? So as we gain that skill, we can learn to then uh, press in from the sides and add more depth to it, right? And that's where you, you're you approaching the mix from the top down, right? Rather than trying to worry about carrying up. So falsetto is definitely a great thing to work on. Johnny, those are some great um, ways to get started with that. So, okay, we got uh, time for one more question here. And uh, the last question we got today. Oh, uh, this, I love this question. Are you born to sing or can you be taught? This one comes in from Joe. And this, believe it or not, we get this question a lot. So I thought we'd answer it again. Matt, what, what's your take? I know we both got our, our own opinions on this one. Yes, to both, right? <laughs> both. So look, there's a book called The Singing Neanderthals. And it's a book that goes back through sociology, anthropology, all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, other disciplines talking about the development of human vocalization. And most scientists who study this field believe that humans actually vocalize melodically before they started speaking words. And we have uh, a lot of evidence that we can clearly see today that indicates this is uh, probably true. So babies vocalize with a melodic contour that is comparable to the melodic uh, contour of the speaking voice of their parents. So if they have parents who have a really big wide uh, speaking range, then the babies cry in that speaking range because they hear that pitch and they're trying to vocalize that pitch contour. Whereas if the parents have a more monotone, then the babies cry with more of a more monotone delivery because again, they're trying to mimic, all right? We know that stroke patients can learn to sing before they can learn to speak, which tells us 
that the brain is more wired for singing than speaking, right? Because otherwise, why would singing to somebody who never has really sang before come easier than speech? We know that people with stuttering disorders can sing without stuttering. But then once they go back to speaking, the stuttering returns. Mm -hmm. Yet again, an indication that the brain is programmed to sing, right? And finally, we know that Alzheimer's patients, if you play a song for an Alzheimer's patient from a certain part of their life, memories can flood back to them and they can have this great awakening of memories. I tried this once with my uh, grandmother-in-law. She was uh, in you know, mid-stage Alzheimer's, but things were starting to slip. And the last time we got to spend time together, my wife and I sat with her outside. I pulled up Spotify and I played music from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And she just started telling the stories we had never heard before. And her sister was like, I haven't heard her talk about that in 40 years. But the songs were stirring up memories from her past while other things were going away. Where at one point she couldn't even remember my name. Yeah, it's the yeah. power of music is, is incredible. Right. So we are meant to sing. Now the problem is, is somewhere along the way when you were a kid, somebody taught you to start judging your voice. In American culture, right? If you go to other cultures uh, where music is a part of everyday life in a tribal community, people don't judge that as much because that's just what you do. But in America, we have American Idol. We have The Voice. We have The X Factor. We have a new show that I just caught last night on TV with Can You Guess the Singer, where you have to guess by somebody's appearance and some Q&As whether they can actually sing or not. So we're taught to judge other people's voices by society. And somewhere along the way, you probably started hearing those things, Joe, and thinking, oh, maybe I can't sing because I heard it has to do this or it's supposed to do this or it's supposed to be that. And there's all these shoulds. And the problem is, is that we start buying into the shoulds and we develop cognitive distortions where we start to think one thing about ourselves that's not necessarily true. You see, this idea of beautiful singing can be traced back to the idea of bel canto technique. Because bel canto technique, which is one of the foundations of classical training, literally means beautiful singing. But here's the problem. Not all stories are beautiful, right? Those stories, which were written for the aristocracy and written for the Catholic Church to be performed, to help conjure up images of angels and heavenly beings in the middle of a church service, yeah, they were made to be beautiful. But if I'm listening to some Metallica, I've never sat back and listened to Enter Sandman and thought, wow, that's just a beautiful voice. No. <laughs> no, right? And there's plenty of other artists that we listen to, and we're not thinking that's a beautiful voice. We're thinking, oh, that's a cool voice. That's a great voice. That's an impressive voice. Wow, they can sing like that, right? And some of them, people like Bob Dylan, Tom Waits, right? They're not known, or Kate Bush, they're not known for any kind of beautiful quality. They're known for the stories they tell and how expressive, communicative, and artful they are with their voices when they're singing their songs. So everybody can be taught. The success comes from when you sing the songs that are right for your voice and you tell stories that you can identify with. And if you resist what is, that's when the suffering begins. So what that means is if you're like me and you're a baritone and you resist that, like I did when I was young and tried to force myself to be a tenor, all I did was hit roadblocks. I'd go into a practice room feeling excited and leave feeling like I was terrible and nothing, feeling horrible about myself. And it became a vicious cycle where I'd go in thinking, I'm going to get it today and I wouldn't get it. And I started feeling bad like I wasn't at sync. But the problem was, is I was resisting what was. I was resisting my real authentic voice. Instead of embracing my inner baritone and telling stories that meant something to me, I was trying to embrace an imaginary tenor voice I thought I was supposed to have and was trying to tell stories that I didn't actually really identify with. And so I struggled. And that's when the suffering began because I was resisting, resisting, resisting. Once I learned to accept my voice for what it is, an uh, edgy, bright, uh, baritone voice with some low notes, some depth, and it can get real harsh if I wanted to, and started finding stories that fit that kind of a sound, then I started finding success. And so, Joe, what I want you to know is that, yes, you were born to sing, and that you should continue to pursue it. 
You need to let go of any shoulds that have made you ask this question. Should I have been born to sing or can I be taught? You need to let go of those shoulds, start making sounds, start finding artists that have voices like yours, start playing with songs by those artists that mean something to you, and then see where it goes. Because the other thing I'll say is in my own teaching, I cannot tell you how many times I've worked with somebody who did start off as, let's say, a baritone. And the next thing you know, they're starring in a Broadway show as a tenor. Literally a story from my studio. Bass baritone who told me he could only get up to E's, who right before COVID was the lead in a Broadway tour as a tenor, a rock tenor, right? So once you start the development, you never know where it's going to go. We just have to give our body time, accept what is, and then we can have joy in making music with others. Yeah, absolutely, Matt. I, I, I really like your answer. And and to second that, uh, Joe, I think a lot of the times we just see the final product of singing. We just see, we just experience as an audience the actual performance, and we don't see all the work that went up to that. And very rarely does somebody just you know, walk on stage and they, they know the song. No, they got to go through a process to learn the song. And if, if there's things to work on in, in your voice, you don't just wake up and go run the marathon. So the song is the marathon. The performance of that is the marathon. But there's all the, the, the exercises that go up to that and the training that goes up to that. So uh, it's definitely something that everyone has the capacity to do. Uh, whether you do it at a professional level or just for fun as a, as a hobbyist, um, you can definitely do it. And, and then it's just how much work do you want to put into your exercises and preparing and, and uh, getting the freedom and getting in strength. Do you like to um, do you like to feel really sore when you run your marathons or do you like to, you know, finish in five hours and then go, you know, uh, in the afternoon and, and go for a bike ride after the marathon, right? So it's really just how much training you want to put into it. Um, and so we've got, you know, this answer, many more, but you can definitely get that training uh, from plenty of the teachers we have here at voicelessons.com. Tune into our videos. Uh, we'll leave this one up. Um, Matt, you want to tell them about the course that we've got? Yeah, absolutely. So if you're enjoying learning about some of the function behind singing and learning what's going on inside your body when you make sound, I have a brand new course I'd love to share with you. It's called How the Voice Works. I met Mike several years ago at a conference in Las Vegas. Uh, he had read uh, you know, some of my writings and seen some of the stuff I'd done online. We started chatting and he was like, I recognize you and your voice from somewhere. I can't put a finger on it. And we kept talking and soon we discovered we actually went to high school together, right? And so we performed together in the music band. We have a great photo that he just uncovered a couple weeks ago from us performing in high school together. It's nuts. So we meet up here like 20 plus years later. He's out in L.A., so, you know, I flew out. We uh, teamed up with the Hollywood studio, and we filmed this course. It's done masterclass style, so if you've ever seen any of the masterclass videos, it's that quality shot in 4K. has a 100-page uh, workbook that goes along with it full of extra resources, exercises you can try. I'm going to use all kinds of models like this. Uh, we have some medical illustrations and animations, and I'm going to break down the most essential elements of your voice that you should be familiar with when trying to learn how to sing. And we call this body mapping. And the research indicates that if you have an inaccurate body map, if you think your body is shaped one way and it's not, that you're going to struggle to get the results you want because you're going to be trying to move things in ways that they actually don't move. But if you develop a correct, accurate body map, of your instrument, you will then be able to take exercises and make them work for you because you will be able to address specific issues with exercises that actually produce results. And that's what this course is all about. It's on a limited special time offer right now. I would catch you before the price goes up. You know, uh, private voice lessons with me are $120 an hour. This course is a four hour course. So you're looking at a $480 of uh, private one on one time plus the purchase of a book. So you're looking at about $500 package. But since we're just launching this out and we want to, you know, let some people get a sneak peek who may not be able to afford that $500 uh, price tag, we're doing a special launch offer. And if you go over to howthevoiceworks.com right now, you can pick it up for $47. So $47 for four hours of 4K video, 
using these anatomical models, using medical illustrations, that 100 page workbook, and it's all yours to dive through and start answering some of the questions that you have that are similar to the questions that we get from viewers all the time about what is actually happening in the instrument and why they're unable to achieve some of the things they want. Once you have an accurate body map, you're gonna be able to solve those issues and start busting through the barriers and the blockades that have been standing in your way and to reach your goals. Absolutely. So uh, we'll share more in the coming weeks, but um, sneak peek, uh, you can just click on the link. We'll drop that in here in a minute. And thanks, you guys, for all your questions. Um, again, stay safe, wear your masks, uh, <laughs> get plenty of sleep, drink your water, take your vitamins, and uh, have a great week, everyone. We'll see you next week. Absolutely. See you then. All right. See you guys. Bye.